Hello, Shah. Welcome to my podcast, One for the Road. Uh, I feel really grateful that you've taken the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. How are you? Well, you're very welcome, Mr. David Wilson. I am very <laughs> pleased to be here. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. We've had a little brief chat. We both like our glasses, don't we? Uh, and we're we sporting. Do. We do. We're sporting big frames today, aren't we, both of us? So it's, so it's the big frame look. It is so uh, amazing as well. So, uh, as people have got to know on my podcast now, we're on season eight now, and they do love a life story. But your story is slightly different, which we're going to come to later on. is fascinating. Uh, but what we do like to hear and go over is uh, where it all begins, um, your childhood, where you grew up, how it was for you. Uh, and if you don't mind, we could start there if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, absolutely. Fire away. Where should we Good. start? Well, you were born in uh, California, right? I was. I was born at Stanford Hospital in California. How, I mean, I won't ask how old you were, but you don't have an accent. So what's happened there? Well, thankfully, um, I, I, I genuinely mean that. <laughs> I'm quite grateful that I lost the accent. I came back. To, so my dad was American. Uh, my mum British. Well, my dad was Sicilian, but born in the States. My mum British. And when they got divorced, when they finally got divorced, um, we came back to the UK. So I was... I was probably like 10 and a half just before my 11th birthday. And what they say, now I don't know if this is true, but it's apparently uh, what they say is that if you move countries before you're a teenager, you will typically change your accent. And if you move countries after you're a teenager, you'll keep your accent. So apparently there is something during those hormonal teenage years that means that you will either lose or keep your accent. So fortunately I came before I was a teenager and lost my accent. So what is your accent now? Uh, British <laughs> London. Yeah, it is American a bit London, South isn't London. it? Yeah, because yeah, uh, I London. Yeah, I grew up in Croydon, so there there might be a tinge of that there. I don't know, but I like it. Croydon. It sounds, yeah. Croydon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely definitely a London, uh, definitely a London twang. I've lived in South London for oh my god, I've lived in South London for about twenty years now. Okay, yeah. people are going, oh, 20 years, moved when she was 10. There you go. Uh, so what was it I'm like growing 30, up? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like growing up for um, you? Oh, uh, you know, partly I want to say living in California was actually amazing. Like being in a country where you were surrounded by this attitude that everything was possible the the great american dream and and genuinely having gone to school there i could the the difference between the schooling systems is like night and day kids no matter your background are genuinely brought up to believe that everything is possible like you could come from the shittiest background and you will genuinely in your bones believe that you could if you wanted to become president of america and i think there's so much to be said for that but my own personal uh, situation at home was was far, far, far removed from that. My my dad was a um, he was a big drinker, but even more than the drinking, he was a huge uh, cocaine user, and so I had an incredibly violent, dysfunctional childhood that um, went to all the extremes. My dad was very smart. He went to Stanford University, um, but at the same time, he, he he was really fucking stupid because as much as he was able to, to uh, uh, you know, he was a lawyer, gone to Stanford, ticks all those boxes and then just loses all the money, snorting it up his nose, getting into debt, all the just, it was really like, um, you know, one day you'd wake up and we were in this beautiful multi-million dollar lifestyle. And then the next day you'd wake up and you were in the absolute depths of poverty. And the depths of poverty in America are very, very different to the depths of poverty in the UK because there is no welfare system in the same way that there is in the UK. So in the States, when we lost everything, like my dad was a complete and utter asshole. 
um, when my mum and dad got divorced, he actually signed over uh, the family house to his parents to make sure that, and then declared bankruptcy to make sure that my mum didn't get any money. Um, he never paid any child support ever for me or my brother. We were the only kids he ever had. He never, ever paid child support ever, not once. And um, as a result, we were we were homeless. So me and my mum and my brother were, were genuinely properly homeless because we didn't have any family out there because all my mum's family were back in the UK. And so um, until we moved back to the UK, we lived in just the most horrific circumstances imaginable. I mean, the stuff that you see on Netflix where, you know, you've got drug dealers on every corner and, you know, um, people shooting up in the corridor. It's just awful, awful, awful. Um, growing up on a council estate in, in the UK was literally the equivalent of living on Bishop's Avenue in comparison. Sounds absolutely horrendous. And how old was you when uh, this happened? So um, we were in that in those circumstances for probably a year, a year and a half. So around nine, ten. God, so I was old that's... enough to know. Yeah, yeah, you really were. And how did your mum deal with yeah. that? Because she had you to look after um, as well, didn't she? She had me to look after. She had my brother to look after. So I've got a younger brother who's seven years younger than me. She, uh, you know... She had no money. She was juggling two jobs. We lived in just just an awful, awful place. Um, some of the stories I share, it's almost like it, it's almost like they're mythical. Like I'm, you know, it couldn't possibly be true, but it was. So, you know, one example was I remember, and I probably was. Um, this was probably towards the very end when my mum. I think this was probably one of the things that tipped her into thinking, right? I, we just can't do this anymore. We need to leave the country that our our um I, I don't know what I would call it our little where we lived it's not a house it's not an apartment it's just like you know like three rooms um it was broken into in the middle of the night with a guy with a shotgun like genuinely with a shotgun and my mom was a super brave and b super quick thinking because what she realized was that it was one of the guys who lived in the area and he wasn't actually trying to break into our house he was trying to break into the drug dealer's house, which was the house next door. And so I just remember her somehow having the the presence in that moment to talk him down. And I, I can't remember the exact details. I can't remember what his name was. And stuff, but I remember her saying just really calmly, like he had just popped in for a cup of sugar. Oh, you know, George, I'm making his name up, right? You know, you've got the wrong house. You meant to go mm. next door. And I just, I don't know how maybe... You know, now I'm a mum, your your senses just go into overload. You just it's survival, right? And um mm. yeah, I mean, you couldn't make up some of the shit that I've been through. God. So when you came back to England, um, did you go into like did family help you or yeah, so I've got a super, super close relationship with my nan who's thankfully still alive and um we moved in with my nan she lived in a council house in Hertfordshire so we moved in uh with my nan whilst we we're on the council waiting list until until they could house us so we lived with my nan for probably oh I don't know like I think we probably lived with her for about six months and then the council was saying that they couldn't move us into a council house as long as we had family so then we had to be moved from my nan's to a hostel for homeless families because that was the only way that we would then, you know, how the system all works. And so it was just terrible. Like my nan would have kept us, but if she kept us, we might not have got our own house for like five years. So we then had to go from living with my nan to living in, a, you know, a hostel for homeless families where we literally had one room. We, we slept in the room. We shared a kitchen and a bathroom with five other families. And we lived there. I would say for just over a year and then we were housed in our own council house and I think it was that was probably that was probably the first time I felt any real stability in my life mm. and what was it like going to the school then in the UK after all that um well when I was living in a hostel it was it, it was awful because I didn't want anyone to know where I lived mm. so I used to get off the bus like a mile beforehand and walk around all the back roads so nobody could see where I lived and it's it's really challenging because if you think like 
I, I had this American accent. I spent, you know, probably like the last two years living off, living off of shit McDonald's. I was probably like two stone overweight and I'm only tiny naturally. And I felt so uncomfortable and, and um, I had an American accent and I didn't have, I couldn't tell anyone where I lived. And so making friends was really, really hard because I didn't, I almost didn't want to make friends for fear that somebody would then want to come to my house and then I couldn't yeah. have anyone come to my house. So I think those first couple of years were extraordinarily hard, to be honest. Mm. So at this stage, the first couple of years, how old were you then? Around 13, 14? Yeah, yeah. Right. And, I, and then I started to really act out and and I hated being at school and I got into yeah. tons of trouble. I got expelled. I got, well, I got suspended first and then expelled and, yeah, kind of. No, the only reason I say yeah. that, Shah, is because, you know, we all hear uh, how Gabor Marte, he, he talks about um, not why the addiction, why the pain. You know, we, we use it to numb our past, especially our childhood. There's a lot of trauma and addiction and stuff. So yeah. sounds to me like you could, without it being cliche, make a film out of this already. You know, that the going from the millions of pounds to literally in a dirty old hostel, coming over to UK, everything's out of your comfort zone being expelled from school and really what that could lead on to is the real feeling of wanting to be accepted right so yeah. Yeah. that that is what happens to a lot of people they got low self-worth low self-esteem uh I was one of them um and that's why I started drinking right is this what you did no 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 and this is why i wanted to get you on to talk about it because you didn't so were you put in a situation at that age where you were encouraged yeah. to drink absolutely i think it's very rare for any teenager probably not to be in a situation where they're they're, they're put into a situation where other people are drinking and they're encouraged to drink i remember somebody literally forcing me to have a sip of whiskey and I I remember the first thing I thought was you lot are fucking mental this tastes like what I could imagine paint stripper tastes like why would anyone want to drink this and that was literally the first and the last time I ever had any alcohol so so did you have a sip yeah I had one sip like literally yeah. I had yeah. one sip and, yeah. and I literally felt it burning my yeah. mouth and I can't remember if I I might have even spat it out but I just remember that burning sensation and me thinking to myself why would anybody do this to themselves yeah it's really interesting actually because I was thinking about my first episode of drinking and it was the same and it was the same when I started smoking right because it's vile and what makes us carry on and a lot of it is peer pressure it's almost going through the pain barrier of drinking it because afterwards you get that fuzzy feeling the numb feeling but then after that you feel really ill and sick you know and and it, and it's interests me how your mindset decided right then and there this is absolutely mad because you know I, I shared a reel the other day about an alien coming down and looking at us earthlings right and being like what the hell are you doing because I'm sure that's what they would do we weren't designed to drink alcohol you know none of our metabolism is designed to drink this toxic fluid right so when this happened and you said you lot are mental and whatever, how, what was the reaction you got? So I think it's really important to understand just the depths of what I experienced at the hands of an alcoholic father, a narcotics abuser father, that he was... I mean, he beat my mum up when she was eight months pregnant in front of me. I, I physically tried to kill him when I was eight years old to protect my mum. So we're talking absolute extremes. Now, 
sadly, when children are put through those situations, nine times out of 10, that child will follow in those footsteps until hopefully they someone helps them create an intervention and they find an alternative path. Very, very, very rarely does anybody ever take a middle ground, which is to be able to, you know, um, do anything in moderation. And then one time out of 10, you turn out like me, which was, I was absolutely binary. Mm. And I am binary in everything that I do, right? I'm all in or I'm all out. I don't do anything in the middle. So I think deep down I knew, and, you know, we can we can unpack this a little bit, you know, later on as well. Like, I think I absolutely have an addictive personality. I think I'm on the ADHD spectrum. That said, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I think entrepreneurs by their nature uh, I'll probably have a higher propensity for ADHD or people who suffer from ADHD maybe have a higher propensity for being an entrepreneur. And I think these two things are linked because I I believe I understood at a very early age that, that I most likely had an addictive personality. And so I think somewhere deep in my psyche, I knew that I couldn't just start like other people could. That if I started, that I could end up like my dad and that I'd rather be dead. Mm. I ended up like my dad was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. So where other people who've grown up in much healthier environments might think, what's wrong? Just have a drink. You're like, you know what? My mom and my nan, my whole family drink. Everyone in my family drinks. No one else is an alcoholic. Nobody has problems with alcohol. They all drink socially. They can, they can not drink for months and months and months on end. They could probably not ever drink again. It wouldn't bother them. But it was my dad and it was that horrendous influence that made me think, I can't even, I can't even take a 1% risk that I end up like that. So I'm just not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. When you said to me about your binary personality, I can really see that because you knew at an early age, actually, that if you did get into drinking, that you would go absolutely hell for level and end up like your dad. Right. Yeah. And because of your experience of your dad, you decided from an early age, there's there's no way you wanted to be like him. So it had to be the other way. Yeah. And, and that played out, I've never smoked and I've never done any drugs. No. And bearing in mind, like I've worked in the media industry, in the music industry, I've been surrounded by people who do all of those things that, you know, as I said, my fat, I grew up, you know, with my mum and my nan when we came back to the UK, you know, they would all drink socially, but I would never do anything. Ever. My mom was a hippie. She'd done every single drug under the sun recreationally, not like my dad, as being a hippie. And, and, and you know, but me, it was like the easiest solution for me, you just don't do shit. You don't yeah. do anything ever. Then you've got oh. no, there is no way you can end up like that. So, how did you channel all the things that? us as addicts, as addicts as in me, like escape from. How? What was your escape? Ironically, my escape, I think, was personal development. And I think I'm just as much an addict, but if there is such a thing, because I think everything has a downside, at least it's more positive than the other, the other options that I might have had, right? Because being an addict of anything isn't positive. Being an addict of work isn't positive, but I think I was relentless in my pursuit of freedom. I was like, I am never, ever going to be poor. I'm never going to be an addict. I'm never, it was just all the list of things I was never going to be. I'm never going to do that, 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 never going to do that. And again, also as a female, I was always, I'm never going to, because I saw my dad have all the money and I saw what happened to my mum. And I said, never, ever, ever, ever am I ever going to be in a situation where anyone can do that to me. And I'm super proud of the fact that that has also never been the case, right? Like I've, even if I bought properties with like my son's dad, we, I've always had my own. I've always had my own. I've always had my own money. I've always had my own, you know, and I think I just got my addiction. My obsession was not just getting myself out of where I, where I came from, but then that obsession became an obsession to pull as many people with me as I possibly could. So what I see here is you've actually turned something that could potentially be so damaging and negative 
into a positive, aren't you? Because you've gone the other way. It's like what you say, you either go on to do this or you go on to do that, right? And that's your binary yeah. thinking and you've turned it into a positive. Was there any point though that you got to, in your career, in your like search for something like, you know, you're an entrepreneur and that, and the only reason I say this is because I am, a workaholic right and since I've given up drinking I've focused so much on work I, I work silly hours I never take time off uh, I struggle to even put the phone I've got another phone chart that I got another sim card in to switch on at 7 p.m and it went flat about a month ago <laughs> like, I don't even know where it is now like, I really really struggle um, with that area to have downtime was there a point that you worried yourself about um like overdoing it in that area i think that point is probably now i think that up until now i think it's just been so there's a there's a um i don't know if you've ever read about this but i find it absolutely fascinating there's something called uh post-traumatic growth syndrome and um it, it's where it it, it, it kind of sounds like it's the better cousin of PTSD but it's not really it's just all it means is that it plays itself out in different ways and one of the characteristics of somebody who suffers from it is they are totally naturally unable to stand still if they are not constantly on the move they feel very very uncomfortable so you feel like you're the gazelle out in the wilds of Africa if you are standing still you're going to get attacked by the lions but as long as you're running, you will outrun everyone. Mm. And I know I've spoken to a lot of people that when I say that, you see this light bulb go off going, fuck me, that's me. Yeah. Like what you've just described, that's you, right? Yeah. That inability to just, you know, just, I can't lay in bed. I can't lay in bed on a Sunday. I can't <laughs> lay in bed on my day off. I can't, I mean, I'm a nightmare. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, and I don't actually think that's, you know, being on the ADHD spectrum, I think that's a a real internal baked into my DNA. Yeah. That as long as I keep moving, I'm going to be okay. As long as I keep forward momentum, I'm going to be okay. But I don't know what might happen if I just stop. So I don't stop because I don't know what might happen if I stop. And I think that is a problem because, you know, Everybody needs to press pause and have a break. And I do things by extreme. So I say all of this, but you know what? I take 17 weeks holiday a year. I take a lot of fucking holiday. Yeah. I, I spend every August. I spend every August out in Barbados, like for a month. And I go away to Marrakesh three, four, five times a year. And I go away at Christmas every year. But when I go away, what time do you reckon I get up? Five, four. Five five thirty every yeah. fucking day. Yeah, yeah, but I'm the same and though. I sneak in my work, so because yeah. everybody else is still sleeping, so I just do four hours of work. So it seems like I'm taking seventeen weeks of like holiday vacation, and I'm so grateful I'm able to do it. Don't get me wrong, and I know it's a first world problem, but I'm still working, right? But but that makes me feel happy because yeah. I actually really love what. I do. Yeah, but I was going mean, to say to you is. Thing consideration you know what Dave that's another thing to take into consideration it's very different if you're doing work that you don't want to do that's yeah. fucking stressful mate I do work that I love doing so it doesn't really feel like work if you do what you love it doesn't feel like work no and that's where I come in from right because I love what I do now I absolutely love it uh I love doing my podcast I've just written my book um I get messages from all over the world uh you know, I, I really love my job. And to me, that's a bit of balance, right? Because if you're getting up at five in the morning, by nine, you feel like you've achieved all you need to achieve. And then you go for a dip in the pool or you lay in the sun. That's that's perfect to me. I don't need to take time off to do nothing because it's not in my DNA. You know? And I've been like that from 14 years old. You know, I got my first job then. And I've always been a grafter roll my sleeves up yeah uh yeah. and I, I just think it's more about balance and 
you know, like, but the thing is going back to that is, is you have found your own coping strategies where us as drinkers, our coping strategy is turning that noise down by having a drink. And what we struggle with in general is that when we stop, we really struggle to know how to turn that volume down, you know? So we go into cross addiction, like online shopping, or we exercise too much. We, are, we go, oh my God, I've got to jump out of a plane and I've got to go deep sea diving in that. We go to the extremes all the time because we need that hit. And again, it's about balance, I think is the key. And that's what I try and help my clients with is living a life that's sustainable to them. Sobriety is bespoke, you know. It's not, oh, well, let's get a thousand people in the room and I teach them how to stop drinking. Of course, that's part of it. But every single individual has their own relationship with alcohol, you know. You're going to be very different from Joe Bloggs over the road, you know. Uh, and But what I love about you is that um, you find your techniques that work for you. Um, and this... this and I do, I do want to just be really... Sorry, I do just want to be really clear that even though I've never drunk alcohol, the the challenges that people who have and the challenges that the that people who turn to alcohol to turn that volume down, I've had exactly the same challenges. What happens is that trauma led me to other addictions, right? So it just wasn't alcohol or drink. So here's the thing. I saw my dad smoke, drink, do drugs. So those, and I saw him fail at work. So what I did was succeed at work, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs. So whatever he did, I didn't do, and whatever he didn't do, I did. And that's fascinating because I literally, I saw that as an eight-year-old little girl, and I think I just thought to myself, right, I'm going to be everything the fucking opposite of you. And that was my driver for much of my life. I can see that. And uh, I work with children of alcoholics. Uh, I'm, you know, I do a bit with Nicoa and I see uh, children of alcoholics go one way or the other as well. You know, Sarah Drake, she had to turn her dad's life support machine off. And then since then, she was at a crossroads in her life of what do I do now? Do I go that way or go this way? And she went that way. And now she's doing amazing, amazing work. And she doesn't drink because she knows how dangerous it is and, and how it's affected her growing up. And, you know, and we do quite a lot of work together as well. And she's, you know, she's only young as well, but she's gone on to do some incredible work like Nakoa or, you know, Callum Best uh, is a patron in Nakoa and you know about his dad, you know where that went. So yeah. it, it's, you know, it's a fascinating what road we choose down our life. Um, yeah. But do you know what? Another interesting thing is like, I've always wondered, and it's hypothetical, right? Because it's it's happened. But I always wondered when I was drinking, I wonder where I would be in life if I hadn't have drunk. And I'm sure a lot of people uh, think that. So I'm going to flip that and say to you, what? where do you think you would have been? I mean, your success, you're incredible. You know, you're an MBE. You've done so much. We go on to... Uh, talking about working one of my heroes as well uh where do you think i mean it's hypothetical again but do you think i mean in your dna you you've obviously got this drive but do you think this would have really really held you back if you had of um drank yeah i mean my first instinct would would be to say to you i genuinely believe it would be impossible for me to drink and i and i say that because i just think i am literally so binary you know like when somebody has a um they have a gag reflex or they have an allergy to like kiwis. Like when my son was little, he had an allergy to kiwis and didn't even know he had an allergy to kiwis until he had like the most tiniest, tiniest, tiniest piece of a kiwi and he projectile vomited. Like his body would not take kiwi. And I feel like that is how I would react. So that, so that was my first react when you said that. But if I push that to one side and say, yeah, but just imagine what would happen if I think the truth is what would happen is I, I would be fucked. I, I would be in a lot of trouble. And then I also do believe that my inherent drive and resilience and and kind of fuck you and fuck you too attitude would just 
come through regardless and I'd have gone into rehab and turned it around but it would have been harder right and mm. it would have taken me longer and it would have been you know caused more stress than my life has already had so I think that I think that there's no doubt if I'd gone down that path, my life would have been harder. And I don't think I could have gone down that path. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think I could have gone down that path and been the type of person who, you know, could just have a glass of wine with a meal because I just don't really do that with anything. Right. I don't uh, just, you know, I don't just do anything. I'm either all in or I'm all out. And and one of the things interestingly, because I know you're going to talk about him, so I'm not going to mention him right now, but, I, I, what I've realized in hindsight is that whether it was consciously or subconsciously from a very early age, I started to develop a work environment and a social environment where nobody else drank, smoked or did drugs. Yeah, it's, it's and that fascinating. And it a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think I did it intentionally, Dave. I don't think I intentionally thought, right, Charles, you don't want to do these things. So go out, find your people who don't do those things. Either it was just like those people came into my life. The universe, I, it and- happens. It, you know, you attract those those vibes. Do you know what I mean? So moving yeah. on, like, I want to talk about him because you were 21 years old and who came along from the universe into your life? <laughs> I interviewed, well, a a tiny bit of a backstory. I won a competition whilst I was at the uh, London School of Economics, very very serious university, doing an economics degree where all of my peers went and worked in the city and JP Morgan and became bankers. Um, I won a competition whilst I was there to write for Cosmopolitan magazine. And to cut a long story short, I interviewed the legendary Chris Eubank Sr. And he offered me a job. And he literally gave me the break. You know, everybody wants a break. He gave me the break of my career. He believed in me. He championed me. He um, he just gave me an incredible opportunity. So I ended up working with him for two years. Um, I handled Ben Eubank II at Old Trafford. I handled all of his press and promotions. I went on to become the only licensed female boxing manager in the world at the time, uh, licensed by the British Boxing Board of Control. So I was this really bizarre, contrarian young woman, right? I was like, I'm like five foot four. I had an economics degree from LSE. I had the British Boxing Board of Control boxing license. I mean, you couldn't really put me in a box, right? But like I said to you, what's fascinating is he he doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. I mean, he does smoke now. He smokes weed now. But but he back then when he was competing, he didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't do drugs. He didn't. He, he took his fitness so seriously. Mm. And so I found myself. I'd created this world where and my work was like twenty four seven. But my partner didn't smoke. My partner didn't drink. My partner didn't do drugs. I then had all these best friends who I met through Chris and they've been my best friends to the date. They're still my best friend, but they all worked in the music industry. Like one of my best friends is Kanye King. She set up the uh, MOBA Awards, the Music of Black Origin Awards, and then June Sarpong. I mean, these are big figures in the music and media industry. And ironic, none of them drank. None of them smoked. None of them did drugs. And you would never imagine that thinking about who they are and the industry that they're in. Suddenly we all had this little bubble of a world and it actually became the norm. So my normality was that nobody drank or smoked or did drugs. That was my, we we all went out, we all partied. We partied just as hard as you guys did. We just didn't have the hangovers the next day. Yeah, I know. It's fascinating. It makes it so much easier, Dave, right? It makes it so much easier because if your peer group, if your social group, if your work group, don't do those things. You're not the odd one out because everybody's the same as you. Well, you found your tribe. They just don't drink, you know, and I've had Shara Delican on this podcast, who's the bass player for the Gorillas, right? Uh, and he's just come back from tour in Mexico. Uh, and, and we were in touch throughout this tour because what he did after the gig was go back to his hotel room, right? And his biggest problem was the come down from the adrenaline. You imagine you're in front of thousands and thousands of people, right? Everyone cheering, shouting, the adrenaline leading up to the gig. 
And then afterwards, he had to try and manage the come down right, which was his hardest thing. It wasn't the drinking, not drinking. It was the managing that, you know. So, yeah, um, and I, I, I've i worked with uh, the lead singer of Death Havana, who toured with Kings of Leon, you know, so many musicians. Uh, and yeah. it is rife. The drugs, the coke, the pre-drinks, you know, drinking all day before they, they go on stage. Yeah. Um, it's rife in that industry, but also all the other guests that I have on, it's rife in their industry. So it's it's everywhere, you know. It's rife in the banking industry, right? So you can go from music to banking. It's rife in almost every industry now. Yeah, banking. I mean, and I've especially actually... drinking. You know, especially drinking because drinking is such a, a normalized, social, acceptable thing to do. You know, most people aren't going to get out lines of coke at strangers dinner tables but mm. everybody would have a drink at a stranger's dinner table yeah but also uh, i've worked with people that have taken clients out nine o'clock in the morning and been drinking at breakfast time you know like it's it's crazy you know in these big posh places in the old smoke in london town you know <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's weird, but I do know as well um, that there are more and more really well-known, successful entrepreneurs that are absolutely sober now. Because when you think about it, right, productivity, you know, mental clarity, all this stuff. If you've been out all night and you wake up hanging out your ass or you're still high on coke and that, how are you going to perform the next day? Well, it's not really a good look, is it? And I don't. I think that it's been really good for me to to not ever have to experience any of that. Yeah, but the other thing is, so Shah, is that I uh, I was asked to talk uh, for to Barclays Bank, right, about the harms of alcohol in the workplace, and and they came back actually saying. Alcohol is an issue, isn't an issue in the workplace. And I, I I was like, are you serious? Like, give for example, forget Bartley's Bank, like a state, not a state agent, solicitors, right? You try and get hold of a solicitor on a Friday afternoon, like you've got no chance. They have to be completed by midday Friday. To be fair, I don't think you can get hold of anyone post-COVID on a Friday afternoon. Well, this London is the is thing. Empty on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. yeah, and also I just think that it's totally unrealistic for Barclays to say that, and I can only imagine whether it was them or any other bank that they they didn't want that to be the case. So their data is skewed and gives them back information that is yeah. more acceptable. Anyway, the fact is, we view. we did do the talk, uh, and it's escalated from there. You know, uh, and they've realised that actually one of the reasons that these talks aren't encouraged is because of the shame and the stigma around the employees, right? So who's going to put their hand up and go, actually, I really want to attend this uh, seminar because I've got a problem with it. No one wants to admit it, right? So we did closed rooms on Zoom, like, we, you know, people could go on there and not... Uh, and then they messaged after and they realised, HR realised there they did need to be a support thing there, you know. And this is why it's so important to get these talks out there. You know, I've mentioned on here before, I did a talk in a college in front of uh, 400 kids aged 16 to 18. I mean, scary. I mean, I'm sure you've done something a million times more challenging than that, but to stand on that stage, and I was bricking it, right? But I actually, right at the last second, I thought, why am I making this about me, right? This is about them and the message I can give to them. So just tell your story, be authentic. You haven't got to be flash or whatnot. You haven't got to do anything, uh, right? And well, the I've, knock got, on I've got a 17-year-old. Sorry, go on. Well, I was going to say, the knock-on effect from that was incredible, right? And interestingly enough, there were a lot of kids that came up after. Sarah Drage was there as well, right? So she told her story about her dad. She was the child of an alcoholic. I was the alcoholic, right? So there was the two narratives there. But the amount of kids that came up afterwards and were asking how to 
approach their parents about their drinking. What well, one person, uh, her dad used to lock himself in the office, and she knew she was, I think, fifteen or sixteen, that he drank wine in the office and would come out plastered. Do you know what I mean? And how does she talk to to the parent or? The other thing, because they come from a sport background, it's a sporting college, is like the message was you don't have to get drunk to enjoy yourself. And you're proof for that. You don't have yeah, to you do it. I, you can enjoy yourself. You honestly, I partied harder than anyone. I would party till 5 a.m. in the morning and be back in my office working at 8 o'clock. So I was. I never sacrificed going out or partying. Um, what I'm going to say, what I find, you know, is an interesting kind of, segues as you're talking about 16 to 18 year olds is I have a 17 year old and so I'm having to navigate conversations around drinking and smoking and and our you know drugs with him being conscious that me being a complete teetotal could push him in the completely opposite direction yeah. and equally I don't believe that everybody has a problem with alcohol. I believe from looking at my mom and looking at my nan, that people can have absolutely full functioning lives, drink alcohol on a social basis, and it has zero impact on them. But everybody that I know that has a healthy relationship with alcohol, they would be able to never drink alcohol again without a second thought if they had to. Yeah. The people who have a challenge with alcohol that would be, I mean, that would just send them into a downward spiral. The thought that, so it, it, it's, I don't want my son to think that just because I don't drink, that I'm completely anti-drink because actually that can have the opposite effect on him, right? So we talk about it and I, you know, we have open conversations around it. So he, he's he's grown up and since he's probably like 15, 16, he'll have like a Baileys with my, my nan because she loves her Baileys and, he might have a beer when we're on holiday and he might have um he doesn't really drink wine um so he's he's drank out he's already drank more alcohol than me mm. but he i've never seen him drunk right i've never and so what I, I would much rather him have a healthy relationship with alcohol and then he comes to his own decision yeah. as to whether he doesn't drink or he carries on and drinks socially and is able yeah. to manage it. It has to be that way. It's about education. It's it's about allowing them to experiment, but also raising awareness of the dangers of where it can go. Uh, I think yeah. if you say to him, look, mum doesn't drink, so you don't drink, is going to make him want to drink, you know? Uh, yeah. So I think it's a really valuable parent bit of parenting there because – it's about educating them without shoving it down their neck that it's, you know, it's, oh, my God, it's the devil's brew and, you know, your nose is going to fall off by the time you're 21. It's it's about yeah, the right education. I, I, I think so because I wouldn't have a problem with him having a healthy relationship with alcohol. Like, my mum's got a healthy relationship with alcohol. My nan's got a healthy relationship with alcohol. My dad did not have a healthy relationship with alcohol. I have an addictive tendency and personality. So my belief is that I wouldn't have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Therefore, I will have no relationship with alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that leads me on to where I am in life now. Right. So when I stopped drinking, I was 54. I know. I don't look it right. And that was four years ago. No. <laughs> it's the glasses, right? And I, my age has gone back 10 years since I stopped drinking. You can see that in my pictures, right? But the thing is, my kind of mantra that I say now is you're never, ever, ever too old to change your life. And the day I stopped drinking, I changed my life in every single area, right? By taking one thing out. I removed alcohol and then everything began to change. Right. So the fact is that the point of this podcast, I think, is to hear your fascinating story. Right. But it's also we haven't messed it up. We can start again. Right. And we can say, well, I don't drink alcohol. 100%. I choose not. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of us are really, really savvy. Us addicts, you know, we, we're really, really resilient. And we've had to go get ourselves out of some really horrendous situations 
and we have a lot of us. So here's some of the stories, and it's like, oh my God, how are you still alive? And how have you managed that? And how have you still got your house and family? And you know, I, I was drinking a litre a night of vodka, right? And I've gone from that to this, like where I've built another business. So I've I've got a top 10 podcast. I've written a best-selling book, right? All in the four years. And the biggest thing, I've kept myself alive and I'm healthy now. Where before, I, the doctor basically said to me, you could just drop down dead any minute because of my blood pressure was 186 over 124. That's like life-threatening. Yeah. I, I, I was over 20 stone, you know, like I would bend over to put my socks on and be wheezing, coming back up, thinking all the visceral fat pressing on my lungs, right, made me out of breath. Uh, everything, my cholesterol, I was on antidepressants, uh, acid reflux tablet. I couldn't go a day without wanting to projectile vomit acid out of my, I could be anywhere in public and it would just come out of my mouth, you know. Like, is that quality of life? No. So the, the point is, we all have the ability to turn our lives around. And that's a really important uh, point. I think it's, it, it, look at what you've done in four years. That is phenomenal, right? That's phenomenal. It's incredible. And, uh, you know, we can't pretend that everybody's going to be able to achieve all of those things in that short a time frame. But I absolutely do believe that every single person, no matter where they are, no matter how old they are, is able to wake up today, tomorrow and say, do you know what? Fuck this shit. Today's yeah. a new day. Today's the day that I draw a line in the sand and I say enough is enough. Because if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Mm. This is the You've thing, got right? To Point, make that decision at some point you've got to say you know now I am going to take a take a line from my book but at some point you've got to stop talking and start doing right at some point you've got to say I can't keep talking about stopping drinking I can't keep talking about the things that I want to do there's got to come a point where I actually start doing it mm. uh, a line from your book Shah what's this then <laughs> let's go on into my uh my book stop talking start doing right that's then, really fascinating right that's 10 years anniversary now right so do you want to tell people about it because it's amazing isn't it i mean genuinely this book uh, in the same way that you stopping drinking alcohol changed your life this book changed my life it changed my life it changed my business um and it really is all about stopping talking start doing doing the things that you've always wanted to do instead of just dreaming and wishing about oh, man just can i somebody's knocking on my window oh we can edit, be able to out. edit this out yeah yeah you sure right yeah, yeah. Twats. Bloody Amazon delivery. Not even uh, mine. I had it the other day uh, with someone on the podcast and he was having a chat with him for about 10 minutes. Oh, Literally. I think, he, I think he forgot he was on the podcast. Anyway, <laughs> so um, let me start here. No. So 10 year anniversary celebrating your book. Do you want to tell us all about it? Yeah, I'd love to, because in the same way that alcohol changed your life or stopping drinking alcohol changed your life four years ago, 10 years ago, writing this book changed my life and it changed my business. And I wrote the book because I guess one of my superpowers is taking action. And I want to be really clear, I don't always get everything right. So it's not that my superpower is being perfect, far from it. But my superpower is despite not being perfect, I'll always give it a go. I'll always try. You will very, very rarely hear me talking about something without catching up with me three months later and realizing that I've already put it into action. Now, those things don't always work out, but I will always try. And so I just had this thing in me from talking to so many of my friends who 
they wanted to write a book. They wanted to stop drinking alcohol. They wanted to get married. They wanted to get divorced. They wanted to move to the south of France. They wanted to run a marathon. They wanted to set up their own business. And then a year later, they're just talking about the same shit and haven't done anything. Mm. Mm. And I just couldn't understand why so many people procrastinated over the things that they really wanted to do. So I thought, you know what? I've had this book in me. These are the conversations that I've had with my friends and my clients for years and years and years. I want to turn it into a book because I truly believe that procrastination and putting things off, we waste years of our life. Yeah. We waste years and years and years of our life living a life that is unfulfilled where we're not achieving our dreams and I don't mean that in some grand everybody needs to be a millionaire and be famous I'm not talking about that shit I'm talking about what is it that you that you Dave want to do what is it that June who's listening to this what does she want to do you know it's about your individual goals as a human being what as far as we know we've got one life and until somebody can prove to me otherwise I'm going to believe we've only got one life and so I think it's just crucially important to Think about the things that we really want to do and go out and pursue them. Just stop putting things off because you never know what's around the corner. And that's the reality. You know, that is life. And, you know, one of the things I'm really proud about this book is not just, I mean, it was number one. It was the number one best-selling book, best-selling business book. Well, actually, sorry, not business book. It was the number one best-selling non-fiction book in WH Smith's for 14 months in a row. It broke all of their records off my desk. I've got a plaque just like a musician would and nobody's touched that record since. And when this book came out, which was only last week, it's a 60% update of content. It went straight into the charts. It's WH Smith's book of the month. You can't pay for that. That's not a marketing thing. All of their book buyers get together and they choose the book of the month. And um, I think we're currently number two in the nonfiction charts. And of course, I'm proud of all of that, but it just shows you that it hasn't gone away. This problem hasn't gone anywhere, right? We're still getting in our own way as human beings. We still self-sabotage. We still get in our own way. We still put off the things that we really want to do. And again, I think part of the irony is we tend to do the things that we don't really want to do and put off the things that we really do want to do. And that's batshit crazy. Yeah. Do you know what? My brain was going around there because it's hard for me to take my focus away from alcohol, right? Because it's true what you say. So many people procrastinate. And that that could be to do with anything in their life, right? So where I was thinking about the alcohol side of it is when we wake up constantly on this hamster wheel of um hung over um feeling trapped feel like we can't get away right that really leads on to procrastination so much you know where we think oh we'll do it tomorrow i'll put it off today do it tomorrow and i'll give you an example of that we wake up in the morning and we go i ain't drinking later I, there's no way in a million years right i'm gonna drink and by lunchtime you have that imp in the mind that's going well, maybe you could have one. And then you're in the supermarket at five buying two bottles just in case, you know. So I think this could be a really brilliant book for the listeners on this podcast to, to get, but not just for the for the moving forward without alcohol, but for life. So I want you to send me a copy immediately. I'm going to send you a copy and I just want to show you something because obviously the listeners can't see this, but I know you love your boxing. So there is a, a Muhammad Ali picture here, right? Yeah. And it says, do you see yourself in this picture? And I want to, I just want to read this to you. So he's with Fraser in the ring. Inside the ropes, there are two guys fighting for their dreams. Both dead, mighty things, and both have great stories to tell. But outside the ropes, there are a thousand faces watching other people fight for their dreams. The point, you don't want to be an anonymous face in the crowd of your own life story. That's a life of regret. You've got to face your fears and climb inside the ropes. And to me, that is what life is about. Because we've all yeah. got fears. We're all worried about things. We've all got trauma to one degree or another. But sitting outside, being an anonymous face in the crowd, watching other people go and pursue their dreams, that's a life of fuckery. And none of us want that shit. 
oh my god i feel really really like empowered by that like i'm normally the one that says things Sha. what's going on people feel empowered by me and you've just hit that on me and it's like god and that that picture in the ring of those two is really brilliant as well and it's like we can all step into the ring right of life we can you know and this is what i say to not people only can you but you must yeah it's not just that you can but you, you must you must step into that ring you must step into that ring because that is where your life is. Your life isn't outside. But do you know what, though, like, Charlotte? And, and this is where I cover it here is, is a lot of people feel they can't because of their self-esteem and their self-worth, right? And this is why I'm not just a, a coach where I help people stop drinking. I'm a coach that help people with their self-esteem because once you start to work on that, they then believe they can and must climb into the ring there's a lot of people that can't go a day without drinking because of their self-worth you know uh, and if it, you can help them if you can help them build up their self-worth and their self-belief and their self-esteem which will all interlink once your self-belief is rock solid you don't need the drink and i can see how easily those two things are interlinked yeah. right because when when you don't have that self-belief when you don't have that self-worth whether it's drinking or it's drugs or it's online shopping or it's something else, that your addiction is what get, fills you up. It boisters you. You know, it makes you, it makes you, it, it compensates yeah. for that lack of self belief. But yeah. actually, what happens is when, like, it's like a muscle. You know, you must have realized this over the last four years that your own self belief, your own self worth has got stronger and stronger. 100%. And as it's got stronger and stronger, it's a hundred percent. And and I can look in the mirror and I can be content with who I am now, right? And before I would look in the mirror and go, what a piece of shit. Who have you turned into? You're nothing. You're pathetic. You're a waste of space. You you can't even go a day without getting pissed, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but it's not just the fact that I've stopped drinking. It's stopping drinking has allowed me to change my mindset about everything it really has that's what's happened to me it's like i feel i can do anything right you ask me to work for you i'm on my way right i'm coming down where you are now and i'll put on my penny and i'll oh <laughs> for he's gonna ask me to go and do your cleaning no it, it, it <laughs> it's really really important that that um how it's changed me is not by just stopping drinking. It's actually changed my mindset, how I view life. Like when I say about ripping the blinkers off, right? I used to look down at the floor. It was dark, like an old black and white film. It was raining, thunder yeah. clouds and now. Yeah. And I've taken yeah. them off and the sky is blue. Not always. It's not always blue. Yeah. But I, I have a, a, a 4D vision of the world now by taking that yeah. one thing out of my life. I think it's important that you recognise that it's not always unicorns and rainbows, right? So it's not like just because you stop drinking alcohol, life is perfect. That's not that's not going to be the reality for, well, I don't know anyone who has a life that's all unicorns and rainbows. But actually, you're just better equipped at dealing with things. And I just want to give everybody a, a, a tip who's listening to this. And, and it's not really related to my book, but it's just related to life in general, that if you want to make a change in something... If you, whether that's giving up alcohol, whether it's, you know, changing careers, starting a new business, the first and single most important thing you can do is prune the people you spend your time with because they have such an impact on you. The more you hang around with people who fill up your energy tanks, who champion you, who support you in your choice to stop drinking rather than question your choice, the people who want you to win and want you to succeed, even if they don't understand what you're doing. Yeah. They're the people you want to keep around you. And I'll be really, really honest. You've got to be brutal in your pruning. Think of a rose bush. You've got to cut those rose bushes back hard in order for them to bloom and truly grow. If you have dead wood around you, this isn't about just having people around you who can do something for you or, or who who have some kind of benefit to you. That's not what I'm talking about. 
you got to prune the people who have negativity. You've got to prune the people who don't support you. You've got to cut right back to the core anyone who is not going to support your journey. They either support your journey or they need to be out of your life. And it is as binary as that. Yeah, I agree with you. And it naturally happens as well with drinking, right? Because people either support you or they don't, right? So they quite often move away and they're not your friends anyway. And what you do after that, you meet like-minded people, right? Like at my events and that, that they go, oh my God, they're actually normal and they're really enjoying themselves and they're not drinking and they look really well and healthy and they remember what I said yesterday and and stuff like that, you know? There you go. And that, that opens doors to everything, trust me. I, I've, like, including yourself, like, I've met some incredible people all over the world that I would not have met if I was still drinking because my life was so tiny, you know. Uh, so your book sounds absolutely amazing, and I'm going to have it on my shelf, and I'm going to recommend it to all my clients as well. Um just remind us what it's called again. It's it's um, celebrating 10 years it's now. Stop Talking. Yeah, it's the 10th anniversary. Stop Talking, Start Doing by Shaw Wasman. Um, you can buy it on Amazon or you can pop into your local WH Smiths and um, go and grab yourself a copy. I would be uh, most grateful for everybody who does that. And, and share the love because I think it's an important message to get out there to people. Let, let's celebrate life. Let's enjoy life for all the moments that we have left of it. Wow. I'm going to end it there because I'm an emotional wreck. Uh, I've loved every single minute of this interview. I'm so grateful that we've done this. And I think it really does tie in um, to how you can change your life in all areas, not just by stopping drinking, but in all areas. You know, we all must get into that ring We are here only once, right? And we have to make the most of it. So thank you so much, Shah, for joining me today. Uh, Don't forget to get a copy of that book in the post. I'll get you one out today, I promise. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Shah. Take it easy. Bye.